Welcome to this public keynote on Centering Equity in Graduate Education. My name is Josephine Moreno, and I am a Graduate Diversity Officer in Graduate Studies and also the director of the AMIGA Project, a holistic review uh, project here at UC Davis in collaboration with UCLA. This keynote is also supported by the AMIGA Project institutions, uh, as well as with generous support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. I have the distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote presenter today, Dr. Michal Kurlander. And uh, Professor Kurlander, her research ranges from the full sp spectrum of, of education, from K through 12 to higher education. And uh, she is particularly interested in the causes and the consequences of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic, and gender inequalities in education. Uh, additionally, she's equally uh, uh, interested in the policies and the practices that address educational inequities. She's also a very uh, well-known researcher, and she's received numerous awards uh, for her work and her work with uh, graduate students. Also, she has also been quite significantly involved in the recent UC consideration to move away from standardized tests for undergraduate admission. And uh, that's really important to us today. Uh, also, uh, what we want to know is that today, Dr. Kurlander focuses her lens on graduate education. That is how and why equity at the very highest level of education is needed. And it's, it's to not only advance science, but equally important is to open, to open equitable access to communities that have been excluded in the past. So welcome, Dr. Kurlander. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and the warm welcome. Um, Dr. Marino, let me just see if I can get my screen shared. Just a second. See some friends in the audience and really appreciate that. Let's see. Um, people see my screen okay? Thanks for the thumbs up since we can't really see and can hear me okay as well. Great, thank you. Um, so just um, really um, thanks for being um, joining me today. And um, I'm gonna uh, send, center my talk, which is Centering Equity in Graduate Education by sort of first and kind of putting out there, arguing that addressing equity in graduate education requires a better understanding of the causes and consequences of unequal opportunities in the pipeline to graduate school. So we're actually gonna talk about graduate education from my own research really does look at the pipeline, how we get here to, unequal even um, uh, inequities in the labor market, all, all the way that starts with early education, then most of my work is on the transition to college. Um, so what I hope to do is to kind of provide some of uh, profiles from my, my own work on inequalities in the pipeline to college to just kind of ground us. And often we're asked to address equity and diversity and inclusion in graduate education. Um, and we sort of assume that we start with the students we have, but I actually think there's a really important responsibility that not just graduate education, but undergraduate education has to address the inequities that exist long before students show up um, at our at our doorstep. So we're going to be talking about some, um, some of that work. And we're going to talk about those lessons for graduate education, they have a huge relevance. And then I'm going to offer some of my own reflections on advancing diversity and equity in graduate education from my broader work with Office of the President, from even from having just completed a term as chair of the School of Education um, here at UC Davis. So I'm going to offer some of those. Um, so let me just start by saying kind of broadly what the, the work that, that I do and, and is to really track opportunity gra gaps. And so first, just to kind of put it out there, I think we all like uh, function in the world often thinking that education is viewed as this individual pursuit and that it's marked by a series of individual choices students make, what classes to take, what colleges to apply to and to enroll in. Um, but that these choices, um, I and many others have argued, are regularly constrained by structural inequalities, those some that are visible and some that are more hidden. Uh, who suggests what uh, colleges to apply to, what courses to take, what's available at your school, access to information, uh, et cetera. Some, again, some of those constraints are visible and some are not. Um, I'm going to show that they're also highly like racialized and also very unequal by, by income and, and that I, I 
um, uncover a lot in my work, um, and, and argue that the only way to really ensure that racial equity in our education system exists is to disrupt those inequalities, those structural inequalities that exist earlier, and to address the, both the visible ones that we see through policies and practices, and also to bring light those that are, are less visible. So I'm going to do that just again. Um, I'm hoping I, I don't talk at you the whole time that we have time for Q&A, um, but I'm just going to just open. So a lot of my work really tries to understand this whole full pipeline. I work very closely at, and have a, a lab at Davis called the California Education Lab, where we partner with state agencies, all of them, the California Department of Education, the Student Aid Commission, UC, CSU, and community colleges to better understand how to broaden opportunities for students. Here's this um, map of an upper elementary school student. This is from Long Beach Promise, is already looking at the roadmap to college. And so today, if you talk to students as early as you know fifth or sixth grade, this college College for All ethos is very much there for them. But I'm going to show you what happens when we just look at a cohort of California students. This is a, just a cohort of California high school students. There's a hundred little figures here for you to think about. And I'm going to show you what happens to them. This is, again, from pre-pandemic periods, just to sort of see what happens six years after they complete high school. So first is that only 81% of students graduate from high school. That has improved over time. Many more exit high school with some kind of certificate. And, and like I said, dropout rates of high school have, um, have actually improved over the last several decades, but we still do not have a, you know, we still have a, a dropout problem, if you will, from high school. Um, and 19% of, of California students don't graduate high school. Now, what happened in the pandemic, I won't spend a lot of time on this, is that high schools actually awarded um, degree receipt and, and graduation in, in larger numbers, given the, the stresses of, of the pandemic. But again, not all of those students um, uh, completed with with the high school diploma, and many did not quite uh, finish high school in the in the way we expected. A lot of work in my lab on the pandemic. I'm happy to answer questions too, because the numbers I'm about to show you are much worse and actually um, at have been exacerbated um, in the pandemic. So, 81% will com complete high school with an actual diploma, and only 63% of those high school students will enroll in college. Um, within uh, those six years. A 27% will enroll in a four-year college, 36% in a two-year college, 18% not enrolled in college. Again, those numbers are now, and you're seeing this in articles, gosh, weekly about the pandemic's impacts. And a lot of that, those impacts is that younger, traditional, what we have thought of historically as traditional age students choosing not to start college um, in this post-pandemic and in, in the pandemic period. Um, of those students, 38% of high school students will actually complete a college degree, and only about a fifth, 21% uh, will complete a bachelor's degree. 17% will complete an AA, an associate's degree of some type, and 25% and will have some college. So again, uh, only approximately a third of students actually get a degree, and only about 21% will get a bachelor's degree. Um, and then most important for kind of the work I look at is what that looks like um, by race, ethnicity, by socioeconomic status here. I'm going to talk mostly about racial equity. And so you'll see um, those rates of college completion within six years of, of exiting high school really vary, right? So 38% of Asian students, I should state at, at the onset that there are um, lots of heterogeneity, lots of differences among Asian, sub, Asian subgroups, but overall 38% of Asian students will get will complete a bachelor's degree six years post high school, 28% of white students, 14% of African-American students, 12% of Latinx students. Um, and so again, African-American Latinx students enroll in college at a rate 20 percentage points lower than Asian students. And when we think about the graduate school pipeline, we need to acknowledge the fact that we have a lot of work to do um, in the pipeline long before graduate school to get students to enroll in college and to complete. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just kind of summarize, uh, you know, many, many years of, of mine and others research and kind of broad buckets. What do we know about these inequalities and, and what leads to educational attainment? And I'm kind of putting them in three broad buckets. I could, I've collapsed some buckets, but the first is kind of um, aspiration and beliefs. And so what, what we think of it, these, these kind of inputs are complex or overlapping sets of skills, dispositions, competencies that lead to educate increased educational attainment for some students, right? So first on um, on uh, aspirations, right? So, and, and beliefs, um, we know that, you know, motivation is a key predictor of educational success. 
um, especially when it's combined with um, a sense of self-efficacy, this belief in one's ability to reach your goals. And social psychologists have also focused on the role of mindsets and a whole bunch of aspects such as social belonging is really key to college success and actually key to graduate success. I will be coming back to these inputs when we talk about graduate education in a little bit. Um, the biggest um, predictor of kind of educational attainment is prior preparation um, for the next level of education. And so many, many studies, my, my own work is mostly situated in this space, looks at access to sort of academic rigor and earlier in school um, and, and, and its impacts on enrolling in college, on success in college, on completing a degree and um, per performance once in college, and even um, the lab labor market outcomes. Um, and then finally, um, a, a really important area is sort of knowledge um, and information. We know that information barriers continue to exist and that they impact students' choices on where to go to school, where to, whether to stay in school, right? So signals along the way influence students' um, decisions about course taking, about college applications, about graduate school applications. Um, and insufficient and often too complex or um, mixed information about kind of information about financial aid or what's you know best, best choices um, that students get um, is often really unevenly distributed. It's particularly important for first-generation students who often only rely on, on um, institutional or systems, uh, schools, for example, counselors to give them information when they don't have additional information at home or from their peers. And so this information barrier that we know impacts students' uneven educational pathways is even more critical for first-generation students. I'm going to come back to these and their implications for graduate school. Um, so I'm going to just talk about a few key examples of this. In particular, I'm going to get to the admissions testing that um, Josephine mentioned. But first, I just want to talk about curricular pathways. They really impact graduate programs. I'm going to focus on math because we have a lot of STEM pathways that, um, and, 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 and graduate programs in STEM fields that are particularly um, eager to diversify and, and have um, quite a lot of, of room to grow in terms of reducing inequalities, and by, by, particularly by race and gender. So I'm just going to look at, again, um, my work heavily focuses on on our California pipeline, working closely with um, the Department of Ed. So this is work we did to look at, um, at math um, pathways. So curricular pathways are shaped by both these individual choices students make, but really constrained by the opportunities available to them. And that is not on students, that's on the schools and the institutions um, they come from. So I'm just gonna show you, for example, just a few highlights. This is math course taking among California 12th graders. Again, I'm kind of profiling pre-pandemic periods. Um, where I want to show you that only about half of students even take math above algebra two. So again, if we're going to be invested in thinking about um, in diversifying the pipeline, I'm going to show you these by race in just a minute. Um, we need to think about the fact that we also have a lot of students who aren't even taking it some advanced levels math that would get them to the STEM pathways, even in their undergraduate education. Lots of, um, if you follow kind of the math wars in California and, um, and what's going on in K-12, you'll know that there's a lot of efforts to diversify these math pathways, to think of them more as a, uh, a mobile rather than a ladder to get to calculus because so many students uh, don't experience success in math um, in high school, and there is, um, and a lot of that is access to good teaching, um, and the teaching labor force and mathematics. And so um, there's a lot of effort to think about innovating math pathways such that more students can stick with math, um, particularly in fields like data science and things like that, and not rule out whole STEM pathways. Um, so and um, so this is just what it looks like by race. I just want to show you again that um, we have really big inequalities. If you kind of just focus your eyes on the darker colors, the maroon and the blue, you'll see those are um, AP, um, AP math and advanced math. I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not um, selling AP math as the only way to, to get through, but it is an important proxy for access to kind of pre to college level curricula while still in high school. And so you can see um, across by race and by SED, you'll see that huge differences by race overall and who takes advanced math. Um, and who takes AP math, again, a function of not just students' choices, but the kinds of schools that they attend and the choice and the, the both observed um, uh, sorting that happens in students and unobserved by sort of suggestions from 
from faculty and peers. Um, and then also we see that we do a lot at the intersection of race and, um, and income and find that across, you know, within race, we see consistently students who are SCD, that is a category for identified as socioeconomic disadvantaged in California K-12 education, either a factor of parents' education or of um, income um, below a, a poverty threshold. All right, so I am going to talk about admissions because it's on the mind and it's on the mind of some grad, of graduate groups, particularly with respect um, to the GRE. And so I'm mostly going to talk about the SAT um, because that's the work that I did, but it, we'll talk about its relevance um, uh, for the GRE. So we're going to look at admissions. This is work, again, I did um, uh, with the State Board of Ed and um, trying to understand um, it's important to note that um, I did this pre-pandemic when, um, when there was a, a, a need structurally to pause the use of the testing. But, um, but one of the reasons um, we did this work, um, and I'll just kind of advance this slide already, um, was to look at the state's assessment. So a quick like two second primer on K-12 education is that California adopted Common Court state standards about a decade ago and then um, created and established assessments for those Common Core state standards. And what's important about for higher ed to understand about K-12 is that those state standards were, were uh, created and then assessed to be able to better prepare students for post-secondary education, both um, in the, directly um, to jobs, but also to, to college. And so those common core state standards are actually much more rigorous. They're more integrative. There's a lot more expository reading and writing, the kinds of skills that university faculty believed um, were necessary for students to come into college with. And so we have these more rigorous standards for our high school students. Actually, it starts much earlier. And then we assess them using a test called the Smarter Balance Assessment. SBAC, I will refer to. Um, and so this work came about, again, um, partnering with the Department of Ed um, and the UCs and CSU system to understand, okay, so we've adopted these new rigorous standards. We've adopted assessments of those standards. How do they hold up? The taxpayers are paid for these 11th grade assessments that every 11th grade student takes. Um, they're much more performance based, they're um, achievement based based on the, the curricular material that students see um, every day, much less abstract than, for example, the SAT. Um, looks like um, their criterion reference, which is to say they're not normed like a, a normal curve like the SAT where someone has to be at the bottom. This is like criterion reference, which is to say, you, do you meet um, standards? Do you exceed standards? Are you below standards? And so we wanted to ask, how do these assessments hold up in predicting college success? And how do they compare with the tests that are often used like the SAT? Um, California is mostly an SAT state, so we don't use ACT or we do some equating to include those who just take the ACT. And most importantly, how do they compare with high school GPA, which has, has we have known, um, uh, College Board and others have done these assessments that tell, uh, you know, validity um, studies that show that high school grades remain the single best predictor of, of college success. So that was the point of why we did this. And then importantly, we wanted to ask, do some of these assessments do a better or worse job predicting college success um, uh, for certain, for particular subgroups by race and by socioeconomic disadvantage. So what we're going to do is we're going to match all of those 11th grade students, the census of California high school students who um, applied to CSU and UC um, and then look at their first year grades. All of you sitting there wondering, wow, first year grades are those the best outcome to measure? I don't believe they are. I think we care much more about persistence and completion, but that is this is what these tests are often validated to do. It went included in admissions is to sort of can you how do you fare in your first year of college? I'll also be talking about them for persistence into the second year. Um, it's important to note that when we do these studies, we actually have to adjust for the fact that students, many students are not even in the study because they don't even apply, right? So we have to think about the range of grades, of test scores um, as um, a restricted range of those who have actually applied, right? And so we keep that in mind as we, as we um, kind of interpret these results. And uh, this is very much what the College Board does to kind of validate its studies. Um, so what did we find? Um, so first, I just want to make sure we know this is not causal work, it's correlational, right? So this is, um, you know, important to sort of um, keep in mind as we interpret what, what we see here. So in, in this table, you're going to see what happens when we um, try to predict UC first year GPA as a, as a function 
And at the top row is just high school GPA. The second row is just SAT. And the third is high school GPA plus SAT. Sorry, the third row is smarter balance. Those 11th grade state mandated assessments that I referenced. Um, the next row is high school GPA plus each of those tests. And the final row um, is, um, is all of those combined. And what we learn is that they those three inputs, high school GPA, smarter balance assessments, and the SAT predict pretty equally well. Um, again, you see um, uh, high school GPA at, at 0.57. Um, the adjusted um, and raw just adjusts for that restricted range because we want to think about this as, um, again, restricted to those who are applying, not to the full uh, census of 11th grade students. Um, in, in, uh, in California, just to that restricted range um, that, that actually apply, but I also show you the raw ones. And so we see that they predict relatively equally well. We also see we do a little bit better when we include two measures, um, but whether those measures are smarter balance um, or SAT does not represent a, a huge difference. Um, uh, we also learn, we also, again, um, do this by subgroups. And here we learn the same pattern, but but more importantly, we first see a pattern that none of these inputs do as well for low income students. That is the SED column compared to non low income students, right? So SED students, you look at all of those correlation coefficients, and you see that. Um, and I'll show these in figures for folks um, who don't necessarily want to read correlation coefficients. Um, uh, uh, well, a perfect correlation would be one. So this is kind of, you'll see these are kind of classic correlation um, effect sizes. But um, importantly for, for purposes of, for that we need to capture here is that you see that all the column for SED is lower compared to the not SED column. That is none of the inputs do as well predicting first year college success for low income students as for non low income students. Um, we find a similar pattern when we look at first year GPA um, uh, for different uh, racial ethnic groups. And we see that again, high school GPA, smarter balance and SAT are weaker predictors of success for Latinx and African-American students as compared to Asian and white students. Again, those relative um, uh, inputs of um, high school GPA, SAT and SBAC look the same across the actual um, levels uh, the actual differences across groups, but the levels, the overall predictability is um, predicted, prediction validity is lower for some subgroups versus others. So what were the equity implications for admissions? We wanted to assess the kind of distributional characteristics of the top, the UC pool using different assessments. What do I mean by that? We wanted to say, okay, if we used any one of these inputs or a combination, what would the top of the UC pool admissions pool look like? And here's what we learned. Um, we learned that um, when we predict the top 10% of UC application pool just on the basis of, um, uh, of the high school GPA, about a 30, little slightly less than 30% will be low income. So this is the percent of the SED. Again, I'll, I'll just say that again. Um, so about a third of the top of the UC admissions pool, if we just use high school GPA, would be low income. If we use SAT, slightly less than 8%, only 8% would be low income. If we use the state's smarter balance assessment, we have 15%. So we'll see that the SAT um, particularly uh, rules out low, when used um, exclusively on its own, uh, rules out low income students much more so than the smarter balance. And really the high school GPA generates the most um, low income students at the top of that UC pool. Again, you'll see we um, similar patterns when we look at these um, inputs in combination, like those later bar graphs, uh, bars, high school GPA and SAT, about 10%, um, and then high school GPA and smarter balance, 16.4%. Um, um, when we do this by race ethnicity, um, again, uh, we, we learn that high school GPA generates the most diverse top of the pool, right? So that is when we only use high school GPA, we get much higher rates of Latinx and African-American students at the top of the 10% of the UC applicant pool, um, as opposed to when we use the SAT um, or Smarter Balance, but especially the SAT. We do back of the envelope estimates that showed how many more kind of Latinx and African-American students this would generate from a typical um, cohort of students, so roughly a couple thousand um, URM students that would be at the top of the admissions pool. So um, 
so, you know, what did we learn from this whole exercise? And I want to be clear that, yes, this work was influential in UCOP's decision. I sat on a lot of task forces. And I want to be clear when I also say the SAT was not, and, and this is important as you think about the GRE, was not exclusively used. We were already using holistic admissions, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but it is it was one factor in, in those. And um, and so as, as UC was contemplating its use, it also noticed that it was using it kind of in context with the other factors that it was including. Um, but, but what we cared about was, is it the best kind of assessments to use? Again, this is the pre-pandemic and we learned that Smarter Balance, a test that every student takes that looks more like what they experience in school every day, for example, and that teachers are actually, we, that we want teachers to teach to this particular test because it is an achievement test and a criterion reference test. Um, that the smarter balance assessment scores were no worse or better, mind you, they're still highly correlated with the SAT than the SAT scores at predicting first year um, GPA um, and persistence rates. In the interest of time, I'm not showing you those persistence rates. We do model the impact on just showing up the second year, persisting to the second year. In general, I will just say none of these are very good predictors, um, telling us that it's a lot that what happens at institutions once they come, that high school ne isn't necessarily, those inputs are not the great predictors for success in college. And in fact, we know a lot more about sort of how to get students into college than how to necessarily keep them there. That's a whole set of, of, of other work. Um, so again, in summary uh, on this work at UC, SAT is only a marginally better predictor of first year GPA than Smarter Balance but the magnitude we, we um, conclude is pretty trivial. It's less than approximately two percentage points. And importantly, we think the cost is, is greater than its benefit. And I'll say more about that in a, in a minute. Um, again, Smarter Bounce is marginally better predictor of persistence, but the, but the difference is, is pretty trivial. And finally, that Smarter Balance identifies, and high school GPA in particular identifies a more racially and economically diverse pool of high, high achievers. So what's happened since the, this decision, um, and since really the pandemic really impacted um, colleges' uh, removal of, uh, or at least the pause at most colleges and universities, and we should say UC did it as a, as a, as a policy, um, at least for now, I'm sure it will reevaluate. Um, at most institutions, it is still a pause whether or not to use the SAT. And I put here as perception of reality. So the first thing we know, that's happened is that many, many more students have applied. And this you've probably seen in the news. That is, is perception reality? Did many students self-select from not applying to our most um, selective campuses because they believed their SAT scores would keep them from there? And so the answer to some of that is absolutely yes, because we see many, many more students applying. And so to the extent, whether or not the task force reports showed that the SAT was not a heavy consideration in admissions, effectively it was because many students ruled themselves out from some of our top campuses because they perceived their test scores would keep them um, out of the running. And so we do see higher um, applicant pools across particularly our most selective institutions, both in California and elsewhere. Uh, whether that, um, again, I've showed you kind of the predictive um, of uh, the results from predictive um, work that College Board and others have done as well, that again showed that the SAT and tests like it may have never contributed that much more above and beyond high school GPA, but it did contribute some over the years. And so not including it and seeing how students succeed will really be work that's, you know, that's done um, over time, keeping in mind that it's confounded by all the other challenges that have existed with the pandemic. And so it'll be very hard to tease out the impact of, you know, a causal impact of the removal of the SAT on, you know, on, on college admissions. We know there were so many other structural barriers that kept students from attending or leaving home or any number of things. And so the sort of dust hasn't settled on how we think about this huge impact on, on admissions um, in the pause of, of the SAT. Um, I, I will say um, that, uh, you know, importantly, this is all still within the context of holistic review, and this has, you know, really important implications for graduate study. Um, so just most of you are doing a form of holistic review in graduate admissions. And so just to remind us, this is the consideration of multiple, multiple factors. Um, and UC was already doing this, right? And so it was already considering um, 
you know, prior settings, K-12 settings. And this is why we never, we, we didn't believe the SAT actually had a necessarily a huge influence, but it did have obviously some influence as we see these changes in applicant pools. But importantly for graduate admissions is the idea of considering multiple factors includes that context of prior, uh, prior setting. And so for graduate admissions, that is very much like thinking about the undergraduate institution and perhaps even going further back, right? And so opportunities for research, apprenticeships, um, different grading criteria that exist. Um, what we know from the work on, on admissions on standardized testing from both um, from a variety of different sources is that um, certain student subgroups underperform relative to their performance. And so work, for example, that I and others have done looking at high stakes tests versus low stakes tests, we see that students groups um, who have an association, this is often called stereotype threat association that, um, or stigma attached to their non-performance um, on these tests do worse when that test is of a high stakes nature, right? And so for example, work like that I've done on high school exit exams shows that students when that test did not have high stakes, did um, much uh, did much more similar to other you know uh, con conditional on prior achievement, but when that test was high stakes, like for high school exit exams, um, they underperformed, right? And so we know SAT test, for example, any GREs high stakes um, students perceive as high stakes um, tests and are uh, unlikely to be as good of predictors for as we've seen for some subgroups than for others. Um, and then those differences are, are, again, I just want to be explicit, have been found by race and income. Um, so evaluation for criteria for those multiple factors should be clearly and equitably applied. That is, we want to think about the diagnostic criteria for evaluating preparation. Do students have access to the same amount of preparation? Um, and, and that also includes the kinds of institutions they go to and the kind of grading distribution that exists in those institutions. Some students come from private institutions that have a very uh, skewed grading distributions relative to some of the large public um, institutions that many of our um, lower income and students of color at attend um, rather than private um, elites. Um, it also requires diverse um, committees and training, right? Holistic review by nature of it um, being an evaluation of a set of uh, holistically, a, a whole set of um, um, inputs means it requires really heavy training um, across, um, uh, you know, across admissions committees, um, and it has to consider our own biases, what we think of as good preparation, what an undergraduate curriculum that we think sh um, should exist. So we need to really interrogate those biases, think about whether we can, you know, expanding those criteria for what an undergraduate major or set of courses is really needed to succeed um, in, in a particular graduate program. It also requires um, monitoring, um, and I would even say collaboration with sending undergraduate institutions um, and consideration of preparatory coursework. This is the kind of ultimate challenge UC has, and I work a lot with Office of the President in their efforts to do this with K-12, to ensure that those math courses are available. We're getting, you know, it's still not evenly distributed, but there's a huge effort to train more P AP instructors to increase access, for example, to dual enrollment opportunities. Similar type of reaching out to undergraduate institutions is necessary for graduate. So a true collaboration to get um, more of the sending undergraduate institutions to understand kind of the, the demands of the graduate program and how to, to play a role in ensuring that those exist. Um, and then I think to be really explicit about the GRE um, and which is relevant to kind of the work I did in SAT is even if I propose to you that even if the GRE does offer a little bit of additional information, is that additional information really worth the cost? That is ruling out students who maybe either don't take the GRE because of fear or take it and don't do as well as maybe their actual undergraduate record um, would otherwise suggest and rule themselves out and never apply. And so when we think about that additional input, because sometimes it is real, it's not necessarily just a statistical artifact, like we might see, an, like I said, an additional two percentage point um, uh, uh, benefit uh, in predictive validity. We have to ask ourselves, first of all, is that is that is that worth it, given is that benefit of that additional um, information we have about someone, um, which is a noisy in set of information, is it actually worth the cost of sort of all the students who maybe would otherwise not apply um, or have self-selected out? So um, that's my um, kind of connection for some of the admissions, but I'm, I'm, I'm uh, sure that there'll be questions about the GRE. And I know um, it's still very much in flux for folks as they kind of paused it because of a, a need given the context of the pandemic, 
um, but um, but that are still it haven't decided whether to and to reinstate it. All right, so I want to kind of take those principles um, um, and tell you a little bit about what we've learned at, about work in, in graduate education. So this uh, understanding of causes and consequences of unequal opportunities of pipeline. And so the first um, is, uh, you know, this point about aspirations um, and beliefs, um, that aspirations and beliefs are malleable. This is important work that our my friends in social psychology have done. Um, and that, you know, can be done through, you know, providing positive role models who nurture a sense of um, uh, belonging um, and they foster self-efficacy. And this is through and not just teaching students, but teaching instructors how to do this, how to support help seeking behaviors um, and how to, you know, establish a culture in a in a department um, that uh, allows this to flourish. And here I just want to give a shout out to one of my graduate students, Annalisa Brown, um, who works with uh, Dr. Devin Horton. I don't know if he's in the audience but um, he's a diversity officer at Davis. And, but in Annalisa's in her own work, I just kind of want to shout out her own work in, um, in, in, her, in our graduate program. She's exploring this, particularly this concept of counter spaces, counter spaces primarily for African-American students that provide kind of identity affirming spaces and that challenge some of the racial climate that students otherwise, particularly in STEM fields would feel. And so places where there's psychological safety and where there's, um, you know, a place where well-being for for marginalized students in a in a historically you know in a predominantly white institution and and predominantly white um, department can exist. And there are lots of examples um, that she is working on, from you know student organizations to cultural centers, or but often can be one-on-one -on -one peer mentoring from um, from faculty. And so I'll come back to that. But this role of kind of affinity group spaces and counter spaces are an important part of the emerging work on, um, on um, thriving for, um, for um, students of colors and, and, and graduate programs. Um, the second is on academic preparation. So preparation for graduate school is again, also shaped by those individual's choices and by the constrained opportunities that students um, encounter long before they start graduate programs um, and that are available to them in their prior schooling environments. Um, and so these need to, we need to monitor them. Again, we can't sort of throw our hands up and say, oh, well, this is the pool we got. It's just really, you know, it's really um, not diverse, but what can we do? And I, I really feel strongly I do this um, in Office of the President to our responsibility to K-12. And I would sort of posit here to this group focused on graduate education that we need to do more um, with our undergraduate institutions to improve that pipeline. So here I'm gonna give my shout out to CSU's CalBridge program. Many of you may be familiar about it, it um, uh, around it. It's, it's a specifically a Cal State program um, that is creates opportunities for historically underrepresented groups, first-generation students, particularly in STEM fields such as physics and astronomy, computer science, computer engineering to increase their numbers in PhD programs. Um, I, you know, if you don't know about this program, I strongly recommend you check it out. Again, it's CSU's CalBridge program. We get many of their students at UC. And they recently, the legislature has recently given them a line in the state budget. I think it's $5 million to expand to other subject areas. And again, they're really invested in those academic preparation programs. And when I say academic, I actually just also mean the sort of the um, experience of, of, um, of research opportunities, experience of what it, um, a career um, in, a, you know, as a PhD level scientist looks like in these fields. And there's just great student testimonies um, on their website. So I encourage you to look at it. Um, and then the knowledge and information, we continue to need to increase access and improve the quality of information about graduate school and what it means to be graduate school ready. Many students may have, you know, not all um, 18 or 20 year olds like know what they want to do and their undergraduate records may or may not sort of reflect, um, you know, what they're where they're at several years later. And so we really do need to kind of increase um, are open um, a source of information and knowledge about what it what it takes to to get into graduate programs and how to collaborate with institutions that um, offer um, more opportunities for um, historically marginalized groups or underrepresented students. And um, again, a program I've participated in there are many, and so I'll just sort of mention the one I've worked with um, is the is at, here at UC Davis at the Poverty Center. The UC the Summer Poverty Research Engagement ex Experience Spree, as we call it, with which brings HBCU students to our campus. Many of our we we have had success in um, recruiting um, 
graduate students into that program. And a shout out to my colleague in sociology, Jacob Higabel, who's been running that program. And so it's uh, part of the success is that we've recruited more students to come to um, UC Davis. And I know uh, Office of the President has continued to in invest in, in that program. Um, so um, I, I, you know, there's a lot more I could say, and I know you've had many, um, many talks as I kind of round out here. Actually, I'm realizing there's, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to get through all my slides, but just want to mention that there's important connections to everything I've said that actually um, lives in this, in efforts like the increased equity and um, grad, uh, the increased graduate education network. This is uh, Judy, uh, Julie Pasalt's shop at USC, who I know has spoken to this group. Um, where um, they are, they have really great and clear principles and actions for graduate programs to increase financial support, induction efforts, um, uh, strong mentorship relationships, student progress monitoring. So really concrete steps. And I know Josephine um, and others have brought the, the attention of these groups and, and then the work um, that you all are doing here. Um, so I don't, I would be remiss if I didn't kind of give some, some pushing on some of my, what I've observed have been um, challenges that um, had to, to accelerating equity in graduate education. And so um, I just want to give, offer um, uh, some reflections. And here I'm going to talk about reflections on equity progress and avoiding what are called equity detours. I am going to borrow here um, from, uh, from uh, Paul Gorski. Um, who talks about equity detours. These are sort of actions and approaches that institutions often adopt in the name of equity, but that create and perhaps just an illusion of equity progress, but don't cultivate um, the, you know, sort of the, the acceleration of equity that, that we would like. Um, there's no sort of full transformation. And so I'm gonna go ahead and, and name some of those and they may feel controversial or not, I'm not sure, but we'll, we'll go for it anyway. And so the first is um, kind of deficit ideology and language, right? This idea of fixing or correcting uh, cultures or behaviors of students of color instead of addressing the kind of structural racism and unequal opportunities. So sort of here's how you need to do things as opposed to, you know, or what's wrong with the weak preparation as opposed to what's wrong with our school systems and our institutions that have led to such um, big opportunity grabs. And so we often need to assess our own language that we use um, that's very individual focus as opposed to kind of institution focus, what's led to some of those. And so the first is kind of this deficit language um, uh, and ideology. Um, the second is the idea of silo DEI programs as sort of equity work is often not integrated with our other work. Um, not to say that specific programs, and many of you work in them, are not valuable, they're critically invaluable, but they don't eliminate the racism or necessarily address inequalities in a department or unit. We can't leave that to, um, uh, um, to the DI shop, right? We can't, we need to sort of look at them closely within our own departments and within our own units. Um, the other is individualizing racism. So understanding and responding to racism only as these interpersonal incident, oh, that's a problem that one professor has, or that we know this is an issue and leaving it at that, um, you know, in, again, interpersonal um, incidents or microaggressions or biases, but ignoring the broader culture that leads for those to currently exist. And so there's a huge need to sort of tackle those and not, um, not let them be a singular, uh, you know, sort of events or incidences that can be pushed aside, but to actually ask what leads to a culture for the, where those can continue to happen. Um, and uh, here we really do often put a real burden on our students of color and on our faculty of color to kind of raise those or not to raise them, um, as opposed to kind of uh, creating, a, again, putting the work on primarily uh, dominant race, race faculty to, which is often white faculty to do the work to understand how to create greater equity in, in, um, in, in their departments and in their units. Um, the other one that I, I think is really, really important and is a real tension right now at the university um, and across different departments is this idea of pacing for comfort and that we often move activities, whether it's admissions or in diversity uh, more broadly um, at, um, in decisions around um, equity and inclusion and access, we move activities at the pace of the people least interested or most resistant to racial equity, when there are often much greater number of, of folks who are eager to push faster and more. And so we just need to think about um, why do we pace for comfort um, and what, you know, what is lost in that process versus uh, pacing for those who are eager and who are doing the work, right? So I just wanna put that. And then the last one is, um, is that equity work should count. 
Um, I just came off being chair and I can't stress this enough. Um, that work is not evenly distributed and um, mentoring, um, interrogating those processes, reaching out to undergraduate institutions that may be feeder to your graduate programs, um, having more voices at the table, all of that takes more work and it should count. It should count in our, um, in our uh, merit promotion systems. It should count in what the work that's valued at the university. And I know I'm not the only person who thinks that and we have lots of efforts to, um, to, to ensure that that's the case. Um, thank you for uh, letting me uh, talk at you for so long. I will stop there and um, take some questions, hopefully.